Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Mr. Tom Clavin. He's a number one New York Times bestselling author and has worked as a newspaper and website editor, magazine writer, TV and radio commentator, and a reporter for the New York Times. He's received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and the National Newspaper Association. His books include The Heart of Everything That Is, Halsey's Typhoon, and The DiMaggio's. He lives in Sag Harbor, New York, and the book we're going to talk about today is one that has always piqued my interest because it's the story of Western legends. The book is Dodge City, Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, and the Wickedest Town in the American West. Mr. Clavin, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. This, uh, I, I couldn't put down. I mean, I grew up, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the old TV shows, Bat Masterson mm-hmm. and Wyatt Earp with Hugh right. O'Brien and Gene Barry. And then, of course, most, most of us have seen two or three different versions of a gunfight at the OK Corral. Right. Uh, but we got, uh, we got a lot of information on these guys who were bigger-than-life legends. And, of course, part of your job was to separate fact from, oh, alternative facts that, that grow up around <laughs> legends like this, right? It was, because uh, you mentioned the gunfight at the OK Corral. A lot of what uh, has been portrayed about Wyatt Earp is, is that period of his life, uh, you know, tombstone and a gunfight and... And uh, some, in some cases, the, what's called the Herb Vendetta, when he went after the guys that had, that had killed his brother Morgan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of legends attached to that. My interest was going back to when he was a younger man, and he was first starting out as a lawman. And that's what intrigued me about Dodge City. And, yes, you're right, there's, there's so much over the decades that have been written about Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson that simply is not true. Or, let's say, was exaggerated or embellished. And... What I wanted to do was was to say, okay, what can we actually corroborate? What what can we say actually happened? And you know, part of the risk of that is, well, if you take away all the legendary stuff, if you take away all the stuff that didn't happen, is there really a good story there? And it was uh, a real pleasant surprise to discover that the actual facts of the life lives of Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson are just as interesting, if not more so, than than the the fabricated stuff that came after. Mm -hmm. Well, they both became legends and were very unique young men. I mean, uh, Bat Masterson started making a name for himself as he was breaking out of adolescence. Mm -hmm. Uh, But but let's... uh, and, And I think maybe the personality is part of what made them who they were. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of person... Uh, first Wyatt Earp was, and then Bat Masterson, who was a very different kind of character, but they worked so well together once they got to be friends. Well, they did. They they first met each other as as, as uh, one winter uh, when they were buffalo hunting, and uh, they immediately, you know, felt a kinship with each other, even though they were very different people in a lot of ways. And just like you, you mentioned the word personality, you know, Wyatt was a, a tall, slender, uh, uh, quiet uh kind of a, a cold look in his eye sometimes, and and uh, he was a reserved person. He was not demonstrative, and uh, it was probably it was unusual as the the see him smile. That's that's the kind of person he was. And Bat was quite different. Bat was a shorter, stocky guy, happy-go-lucky. He liked the practical joke, liked to laugh, liked good times. Uh, Bat and Wyatt Earp did not drink alcohol. Uh, you know, most most movies have portrayed him and Doc Holliday, for example, at the bar belting down shots of whiskey. Well, Wyatt could not make, whiskey made him sick, so he might have the occasional small beer. That's about the most. But his drink of choice was coffee. Bat Masterson liked the nightlife. He had no problems with alcohol, and, and so they were very different kind of guys. But uh, they, as Bat would later say, Wyatt Earp became the, you know my my best friend, and, and they sort of remained best friends for the rest of their lives. And it was because of that that friendship, and I guess you could say opposite attracts, but because of that friendship, they became unusually effective lawmen. They literally, in Dodge City, when danger could be on any corner, had to have each other's back. And interesting uh, how they got to Dodge City. I mean, uh, Wyatt was part of a farming family, and he didn't really care for farming. It was awfully boring. That was true of both of them, really, mm-hmm. because you know the the Earps had had uh, had been farmers, and and uh, the, the Nicholas Earp, the father, had done a bunch of other things too, including getting arrested for 
for making and selling moonshine. Uh, but yes, Wyatt did not care for farming. He couldn't get away from the farm fast enough. And the Mastersons, who had settled on a farm about 14 miles north of Wichita, Kansas, uh, Bat also, when, as soon as he could, when he was 17, 18 years old, he said uh, to one of his brothers, come with me, let's go find adventure. And off they went. So they had that kind of restlessness. That was, I don't know if it would be unique to them, though, because you're talking about a time in the 1850s and 1860s when, you know, the frontier was working its way west, you know, across Kansas, across Nebraska, toward Colorado. And there were a lot of young men who were saying, gosh, this is a, this is a, a time to, to go out and find, find adventure, to see where, where, what's happening out west. And, and maybe we can make a name for ourselves. Maybe we can make money. Maybe we can just have a good time. And so Wyatt and Bat became part of that westward expansion. And uh, talking about the westward expansion, uh, Kansas was on the edge of the Old West in the 1870s. And um, if it weren't for the railroads and the, and the cattle that came up, uh, Dodge City might not have been as thriving a place as it was. Uh, and... Uh, all that buffalo hunting, we mentioned that they, they, they both did some buffalo hunting, and that was a perilous profession, a stinky profession. Yes. Talk a little bit about the life of buffalo hunting that really made the West uh, yeah. wealthy in, the, in places. Well, the reason why young men like Wyatt and Bat and hundreds of others went into it was that there was a way that you could make some pretty good money for the time because buffalo hunting paid well when, when, at a time when there was a lot of buffalo and there was a great demand back east for buffalo hides, buffalo tongues, you know, things like that. Uh, but it was it was awful work. I mean, it was it was backbreaking work. It was you mentioned the word stinky because they they were you know having to cut these buffalo after they were shot. They had to cut these buffalo, skin them, cut them up, take certain parts of them, uh, dry out the hides. Uh, all this had to be done uh, day after day after day in in southern Kansas and in, in, in North Texas. And uh, certainly the, at the peak of summer, it was really nauseating work they had to do. You well paid for it, but it was nauseating, so you had to balance one against the other. And uh, Wyatt didn't stick with it too long. I think he just did it for one year, and he was done with that. Uh, Bat and his and his, one of his brothers, well, actually a couple of his brothers, they they came back and did it like two or three years in a row because they they just felt that they wanted to make that money, and, and, and they did, but eventually they all left it, too. And the other thing that happened was, in a way, the buffalo left them because the herds, as we all know, buffalo herds were decimated. Uh, you know, millions were killed off, and so eventually there came a time when there just wasn't enough work to go around for young men. It was amazing, uh, the description of buffalo herds and how they would cover square miles, and mm -hmm. th there were so many millions of them. But unlike most animals, when you shoot one, the rest of them didn't run. So, <laughs> Yeah, they weren't very bright beasts, and <laughs> that was, you know, that made for, for uh, uh, their, their population, go, you know, reducing rather quickly. It was great for the buffalo hunters because, yes, with most other animals, if you have a few of them to have a pack of animals, you, you shoot one, the rest are going to get scared and run off, and that didn't you know, you shoot a buffalo, and it didn't cause a stampede necessarily. So uh, you could, you know, there, there were, I talk about in the book, there were some of these uh, uh, men with rifles who became sort of Buffalo Bill being the most famous, but they they could just kill, you know, dozens and dozens in a single day. And, and part big reason for that is because the buffalo didn't, didn't take off after the first gunshot. Mm -hmm. Another big reason, though, was the power of a fifty caliber rifle that became popular. The Sharps. The buffalo. Yeah. yeah, the Sharps rifle. I mean, that was, that was created, you know, perfectly for buffalo hunting because it was accurate. It could shoot, send bullets long distances and make a powerful impact. So you had that combination of, of of plenty of buffalo technology, uh, eager men on the frontier looking to make some money, and in some cases a reputation for themselves. And it was, it was an ex it was an exciting time. But eventually, like I say, when the buffalo herd started to diminish, people like Wyatt Earp and Bat Masters had to find something else to do with their lives and and, and another way to make a living. Mm -hmm. Well, now it was a, it was a perilous profession too because the Plains Indians didn't much care for the right. intrusion in their territory, and that became a big part of of what was going on in the 1860s and 70s, right? It was because the Indians uh, depended on the buffalo, you know, not just for food, but for you know they would they would use the entire animal for for things to create their tents and 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 ornaments and and in addition to food, all kinds of things. So when an increasing number of white buffalo hunters showed up on the prairie, they were Indians were were really n nervous about this could threaten their survival, and and there's there's at least one event that uh, that I portray in the book when Bat Masterson was attacked by Indians. He was out. He had made a classic mistake of of going out after a buffalo alone. I mean, you're supposed to travel together, and 
he this buffalo he was you know tracking it and he finally found it and right after he shot it and he was going to start seeing it these other indians showed up and they took it from him they took his gun they took his horse and uh they he's lucky he didn't he didn't get killed now Bat was the kind of guy that didn't let the insults like this, uh, you know, go un- unrevenged. So he, he got another guy, and they went tracking after these Indians, and they ended up finding them. And on a Christmas day, I believe it was, they snuck in and they stole the, the, the that particular tr- band of Indians. They stole their horses and rode them helter skelter all the way to Dodge City, where they sold them for a good piece, good piece of change. So Bat has revenge and probably made more more money than he would have done off that buffalo. Mm-hmm. There's another extraordinary event involving uh, the indigenous in the uh, adobe settlement uh, when they had to batten down the hatches and fight off a a, a much larger uh, group than the white man there had. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because we're talking about the Battle of the Adobe Walls, which took place, I think, in 1873, 74 in that neighborhood. And that was another, uh, the, the Quantaparco and his band of Com- Comanches attacked this this outpost that had been set up to hunt buffalo and to, to, to trade with other buffalo hunters. And Bat Masterson was one of the people that was part of this party that they served partly as a hunter, partly as sort of like a um, uh, protective, you know, we're one of the soldiers here. And and uh, it was another battle in which he distinct they fought off the Comanche and Bat really distinguished himself and and I'm glad you brought that up because a big reason why I had such enjoyment working on this book was because of being able to uh, find out and relate to readers Bat Masterson's adventures. You know, as you mentioned at the top of the interview, you know there were some of us of a certain age who remember there was a TV show called Bat Masterson with Gene Barry, but. Other than that, a lot of people will recognize the name Bat Masterson, but not really know who was Bat Masterson. Was he an outlaw? Was he a lawman? Was he a gambler? Was he this, that, that, that or the other thing? And you Actually, know, he was know most it. of those. Was he? he was all of the above. <laughs> yeah, he was. And and he had a really adventurous, exciting life that, that lasted right up until literally the last day of, of, of his life when he just suddenly died at that uh, sitting at a typewriter in, at his newspaper office in New York. So, so uh, with Wyatt Earp, there's things that he's, he, we, we've known about him. We've seen him portrayed in a number of movies. But Bat Masterson was a pleasant surprise for me in this book. Mm-hmm. Well, let's uh, let's look at the confluence of factors that made uh, Dodge City the wickedest town in the American West. Mm-hmm. There's, of course, the buffalo hunters. But as the rail was stretching across the, uh, the New West, uh, cattle drives brought a lot of cowboys and cattle through uh, Kansas towns to load onto the rail. And then to support the lifestyle of someone who was weary from the trail, there were bars and halls with dancing uh, going on and mm-hmm. brothels. And it, for a while, br- uh, brothels were legal in Kansas, right? Well, they were. I mean, the the uh, when the railroad came to Dodge City in 1872, that really made that town, you know, first in a way that wasn't particularly savory, but... You know, it meant that you had all these Texas ranchers and the cowboys were bringing tens of thousands of cattle up through Texas and across that Cherokee, what they called the Cherokee Strip and into Kansas and to Dodge City where they could be loaded on the cars, taken to the Chicago and slaughterhouses elsewhere. And then the cowboys would get paid off. Well, here they are in a town with cash, you know, throbbing in their pockets. And and uh, the the saloons were only so happy to sell them alcohol, the dancing, the entertainment, the brothels. It was all part of doing business, and a very good business, too. Uh, what Dodge City, you know, the business people began to realize, though, was, was it got increasingly violent quickly. And people were literally just shooting each other in the streets, and they couldn't bring them up to bury them in Boot Hill fast enough. And so they started to realize, you know, we're, we're getting to a point here where the, the Texas ranchers are going to bring their cattle elsewhere because it's literally too dangerous for their people to come to the Dodge City. So that's where you started to, the the effort started to come to we got to put some law and order. We got to we got to tame Dodge City a bit and which eventually led to people like Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson putting on a badge. Mm-hmm. But but Wyatt stood on the windy side of the law in, in his early years quite a bit. He was a bouncer he, he, in brothels. He, he, he even served time in prison for being a horse thief. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's another thing that intrigued me so much about doing this book is when we've seen Wyatt portrayed in Tombstone days, either in books or in movies like Tombstone and Dodge City and My Darling Clementine and things like that, 
we see a, a Wyatt Earp who seems to be a f- pretty confident lawman, an experienced lawman, a guy who's always on the right side of the law and knows what to do in a situation and is a cool customer. That was not the Wyatt Earp of Dodge City. The Wyatt Earp that, the, that was in Dodge City was somebody who was only a little while removed from being something of an outlaw himself and being, like you say, on the windy side of the law. And and he was, fig- try- he was figuring it out in Dodge City. It's really where he became a lawman. The same thing with, with Bat Masterson, who was only 22 years old when he was elected sheriff of, of uh, Ford County. You know, he, they, these these young men, uh, they they had not gone to a police academy. You know, there was no <laughs> training ground to be a sheriff or to be a marshal. And, and a lot of guys did keep flopping back on one side of the law and the other. But Wyatt and Bat and, and some of the people who surrounded them, including the Earp brothers and the Masterson brothers, they they had to uh, uh, sort of sort of improvise uh, a, a justice system, a law and order system, and and they eventually you know did what they needed to do in Dodge City, which sort of set the pattern certainly for Wyatt for his future in Tombstone. Now he, he uh, learned law in uh, there in, in Dodge City, and he had a technique that was more important than than mm-hmm. his six shooter because he was an accomplished pugilist, and that came in real handy given how outgunned he often was. He did. Uh, you know, there, there were there were two reasons why uh, there was not a lot of gunplay, at least on Wyatt's part. You know, one was because, as he told you know his deputy sheriffs and others when he was there, I got hired not to you know to stop the killing, not to kill more people. So part of his mandate was you you got to you know dial down the violence that's going on in Dodge City. But another reason was that uh, you know people who were marshals and sheriffs and deputy sheriffs. They didn't make much money. I mean, they had they had pretty modest salaries. So a way to supplement the salary was you got paid two dollars and fifty cents per arrest. If a guy died, you didn't get you two fifty. <laughs> you can't put a dead person in jail. Mm-hmm. So the idea was we've got to arrest people and we take them to jail. They go before the judge. They pay a fine, and we get a piece of that fine. We get two dollars and fifty cents. So what you were alluding to before is is why it had something called buffaloing which was when he went for his gun, he whipped it out, and he cracked somebody over the head with the barrel of the gun and knocked him out, and drag, he dragged him off to jail. This way they'd wake up with a headache the next morning to be able to go before the judge. There was some gunplay. I mean, there was some shooting, but uh, the, 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 the whole concept was if we're going to really establish some law and order here on the frontier, we, ha- we have to stop killing people. We have to br- actually bring people before a judge, you know, support the justice system, not, not ignore it. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was pretty good with his fists as well as clunking him on the head with that, that pistol. He was. Well, you mentioned an experienced pugilist. Uh, earlier in his in his life, before he became a lawman, uh, he and Virgil had uh, gone out west, and they were stage drivers and freight haulers, and they would visit a lot of the, you know, be part of a lot of mining camps and other camps out there in the west in Arizona, New Mexico. And uh, one of the ways that you could survive is, is be a good fighter. You know, be be a bare knuckle, good bare knuckle fighter, and uh, it was a way to make some money on the side. But sometimes it was also a way that you you know you survived among the really a lot of rough characters out there. And Wyatt became a really really good bare knuckle fighter. It also helped that he was a little bit taller. You know, he was six foot tall, which today would not impress us as being a tall person. But in 1860s and 1870s, that was probably half a foot taller than the average male height. So he became somebody who could uh, literally knock somebody on the top of the head. Mm-hmm. So uh, a couple of more things about the character of, of Dodge City. Uh, you, you mentioned Boot Hill, and mm-hmm. we, we don't want to let that pass. I mean, Boot Hill was a place where people who couldn't afford you know, a good cemetery wound up getting mm-hmm. buried. And uh, it was starting to get full up there before they uh, established It was the starting to get full. It was, it was you know, they were, they were dragging bodies up there and... You know, they might be in the middle of burying one, and they get a call as another one. <laughs> Can I go get that one? And there was a sense of humor to it, too, for a dark sense of humor, as you can imagine, from some of the people that was uh, the buried. You know, there was one one uh, wooden cross there had uh, of a gunshot victim had etched into it. He died of lead poisoning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so Boot Hill, and I think what's something that, uh, again, about Boot Hill that's interesting is that uh, years later, we're talking about uh, towards the end of the decade, the 1870s, when Dodge City was had become a place that people could feel safer in, and, and there was a law and order system, and people like like Doc Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson had sort of done their job there, 
Boot, Boot Hill was closed down, and it was replaced by a school. And I think that's a very symbolic thing that happened at Dodge City. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the last thing I want to make sure we address about the, the wickedest city is that the Earp brothers in particular uh, had multiple wives. Or well, we call them wives. They may have been common-law wives. But they usually found them in the brothels, right? They did. Uh, you know, one of Wyatt's brothers was had actually a very long, you know, enduring marriage to to a woman named Bessie, and they uh, they were basically their business was they were brothel operators. Uh, they employed their brothers a couple of times as bouncers, uh, and and you know, Wyatt had four wives. Some of them overlapped, and at least two of them were were uh, had been brothel employees. Uh, you know, you have to remember this. This was the the frontier where the, things weren't as cut and dried as far as marriage was concerned, and maybe there wasn't a judge available, or you know, the, you you uh, you you'd find sometimes in the census, like for for eighteen seventy, a woman referred to as a sporting girl, you know, which which is a euphemism for she worked as a brothel. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that it was a respectable occupation, but but in those days it was recognized as a necessary occupation it was a way for for somebody to make money and and uh, and uh, sometimes that's you know people supported their families by being connected to brothel work mm-hmm. part of the law enforcement i want to i want to touch on too is uh, is funny as a kid i watched all those westerns and i had toy guns mm-hmm. and I, I, they were buntline specials and i had no idea what i was talking about when i called right. them buntline specials but ned buntline is an important part of history here too well, I think the Net Buntline story is, is is really representative of what I was trying to do with Dodge City because there's been the story that's been handed down since the 1800s that Ned Buntline, who was a who was a real character, he was a writer of of dozens uh, dozens and dozens of of dime store novels in which he would about the adventures of Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson and Doc Holliday and Wild Bill and Buffalo Bill and. And a lot of what he wrote, he composed in his estate in upstate New York. He he just made this stuff up, and this, the public ate this stuff up about the life and adventures of these legendary characters. And one of the stories is that in 1876, Ned Buntline uh, went out to Dodge City. He had gotten a Colt manufacturing company to produce six pistols with these very long barrels that were called Buntline Specials, and he awarded them to Wyatt and Bat and four of the other lawmen in Dodge City. And uh, the story is a total fabrication, but it's persisted ever since because it makes you know it's a, it's a really cool story. And that, that the idea that that Wyatt and some of these other lawmen had these long barreled guns that they could subdue the bad guys with, it just never happened. Uh, in 1876, Ned Buntline, uh, first of all, it would never set foot in Dodge City, and, and second of all, Colt has no record of making such guns. But it makes for a good story. But uh, the, there's still plenty of stories in Dodge City that actually happen mm-hmm. that are worth telling. To, and, and it's kind of fun to poke fun at the ones that, that have been exaggerated over the years. Well, you, you mentioned some names, and this book is full of the names that we all know from whatever piece of history we have of the Old West, from Wild Bill Hickok and Buffalo Bill Cody, John Wesley Harden, Frank and Jesse James, Billy the Kid. Mm-hmm. These guys encountered all of them, didn't they? They did. That was another thing that was a lot of fun, a fun discovery for me with, with is that Dodge City was such a crossroads for a lot of characters. Uh, they were, you know, Wyatt and Bat and Dodge City had connections to all these characters in one way or another, some of whom came through Dodge City, come, some of whom, uh, Belle Starr, for example, a famous female outlaw. There's a story in the book about the day she came to Dodge City and what a impression she made on the locals. Not a very positive one because she took all their money, but you know, this and it's a it's a story that actually happened. It's not it's not an embellishment. It's not a legendary story. It actually happened, and it was fun in this book. It allowed me because of the Dodge City connections to tell some of the stories about the lives of these famous characters. <laughs> Uh, Frank James, for example, and Bat Masterson became friends, and they corresponded till the end of, of Frank James's life. Uh, Doc Holliday, there's a story in the book about uh, one time when when uh, the James brothers uh, came came, you know, and they had dinner together. Wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall for the conversation there with these outlaws? Uh, you know, Doc was one of those guys that was very much, existed very much in a gray area of the law, and certainly the James brothers did uh, to be generous. And uh, to have them get together and break bread together must have been a fascinating dinner, but it actually happened. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed really being able to incorporate all these other characters. I mean, even Theodore Roosevelt plays a role in the book because of his friendship with Bat Masterson. And and a couple of uh, uh, Civil War generals, uh, Sherman and... uh uh, Sherman, Phil Sheridan, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Grant, of course, he was he was was president in the early uh, eight, 1870s. Uh, so 
there was very much a civil war lingering aspect of it, you know, that that happened too, because Wyatt and the Earps had been, three of the Earp brothers had served in the Union Army, and then Wyatt finds himself as a lawman in Dodge City, where he's constantly encountering the Texas Cowboys, and the Texas Cowboys resented that they had to pay attention or listen to a lawman who had, whose family had sided with the Union during the war. Mm-hmm. Um, do, back to Doc Holliday, because... Uh... You know, the way he's portrayed, at least in the Kurt Russell Tombstone mm. movie, is that he's quite the marksman, an outstanding gun hand, gunslinger. <laughs> but uh, you tell stories about uh, how bad a marksman he was sometimes when he pulled out his pistol. With a handgun, yeah. He, was, he wasn't he was very accurate at all. I mean, he was a danger to himself and anybody standing nearby. Uh, he was a good man with a shotgun, so I would put it that way. Mm-hmm. But but uh he he was uh, he was not i mean he could draw fast and, and, but but uh he wasn't you know once once the gun was out of the holster anything could happen so uh there were some shootouts that he was involved in that uh re- resulted in in almost comical outcomes uh so so doc uh, you know you mentioned about the the, the movies i i think uh, uh you know most people remember Val Kilmer's portrayal of Doc mm-hmm, Holliday yeah. in Tombstone, and that's got to be the, the that's got to be the best one. And you know, and I couldn't help when I was writing about Doc Holliday in the book. I you know, the image that kept being in my mind was Val Kilmer. He's, he's some he's one of those cases where an actor just so solidly, you know, blended with a role that you can't separate the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I, I can not think of another role portrayed more powerfully than that one was. That uh, just that sticks with me. I, I have a T-shirt that says, "I'm your Huckleberry." <laughs> and it was so accurately done too, because some of the other Doc Holliday portrayals, you know, there's a movie called the, My Darling Clementine. He's played by Victor Mature, this big yeah. robust actor. Yeah. And you have a guy who's slowly dying of tuberculosis. So I think Dennis Quaid played uh, Doc Holliday in the uh, uh, the Kevin Costner version of the gunfight at the OK Corral, and and, and but Val Kilmer really really takes the cake. Mm-hmm. So um, they. Both Bat and Matt and Wyatt spent their time with their brothers off and on, uh, lawing in Dodge City. And at some point, Virgil made his way west to Arizona. Yes. I mean, Virgil and, 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 uh, and his wife, they, they started working their way west because Virgil, they, they went out there to, to, uh, to you know, find a way to make a living. And uh, at that time in Arizona, there were a bunch of gold and silver strikes, so there were some people who were making some good money out there. Virgil eventually became a, a lawman uh, in, in Arizona, and eventually he was the one that, that wound up in Tombstone first. Uh, and he was writing letters to his brothers saying, you know, this is a, Arizona is a, a good place, uh, you know, there's some money to be made here. And at this point, we're talking about the late in the 1870s, Wyatt and Bat had both been lawmen in Dodge City for several years, and Wyatt was getting restless, and, and uh, it was time to move on. And it was, it was uh, listening to... You know, reading those letters from Virgil that made him decide that, you know, by this time he was with his third wife. So he and his third wife uh, started heading to Tombstone, where he would meet his fourth wife. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so, yeah, he had a little bit of a complicated domestic situation, uh, and that's how they ended up in Tombstone. And that would be a whole other chapter of uh, of Wyatt's life. And of course, by then, he and Doc Holliday, Doc, he and Doc had, were, were friends in Dodge City. Most people think that it didn't happen till Tombstone, but it was Doc ended up in Tombstone himself because he followed. You know, he and his girlfriend, Big Nose Kate, followed uh, Wyatt out out to Tombstone. Uh, Bat went in a different direction. He went out to Colorado, and he wanted. He still served as a lawman in different capacities. He was a gambler. He was a. He ran a vaudeville theater. You know, he did all kinds of things, and eventually would end up as a newspaper man in New York. It's interesting. He was uh, uh, part of a war between two rival railroads, wanting the yes, right of way. The red. I think it was the Red Gorge. Uh, the war. The Red Gorge War, where. There were two railroads that were you know, fighting over a right of way, and one of them hired Bat Masterson to sort of, and he brought Doc Holliday along with him uh, to sort of uh, have this. I guess you'd have to call him like a vigilante army kind of thing uh, to try and, and uh, encourage the other side to back down and let the railroad come through. Uh, but that was Bat's life. You know, he was always up for adventure, and sometimes uh, he wore a badge, and sometimes he didn't. Mm-hmm. We only have one minute left, and it's uh-huh. too bad. But uh, as we get Virgil to Tombstone, eventually Wyatt and some other other brothers end up there, and he even called Bat to come help him because he had so much trouble with the cowboys who mainly worked for the McClowries and the Clantons, and and that leads us to I- introduce Curly Bill and uh, Curly Johnny Bill Ringo, yeah. and, and all those people we're familiar with that were part of uh, the the 
the legend that goes on in the Tombstone movie. This is an interesting history. Uh, it's devoted to trying to hit, handle it with a, a factual account of larger-than-life heroes. The book is Dodge City, Wyatt Earp, Bats Masterson, and the Wickest Town in the American West. The author is Tom Clavin. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I remind you, if you don't hear our regular broadcast during the week, you can also pick us up on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. I'm your host. Thanks for listening.